Welcome back students. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about open source software and what it means because QGIS is open source and I think there's a lot of confusion about the term. First of all, open source is not the same as freeware or shareware. The only thing that they have in common really is that the software doesn't cost any money up front. Freeware and shareware were business models that became popular in the 1990s, but it's important to understand that generally they were still a business model undertaken by people who were trying to earn money, either by providing a reduced set of features for free and then charging money for a more complete version, or sometimes they included advertisements with the free version and would offer a paid version with no ads, or sometimes they would simply ask for donations. And often these were developed by single users, and I refer to it as the garage tinkerer model. But that's not what open source is at all. Open source is better thought of conceptually as crowdsourcing a software project. In this case, rather than a single developer working alone in his garage to develop something that he wants to earn some money on, there's a community of developers, each of whom is contributing a little bit of their expertise to improve the product. And there's a lot of theory as to how this crowdsourcing approach is often the quickest way to arrive at the optimal solution to a problem. Let's look at a couple of examples of open source software projects first. So let's ask the question, who uses open source software? And the answer is that we all do. Oftentimes we just don't know it. In fact, the World Wide Web is driven largely by open source software. There are commercial solutions too, but by far the majority of the content on the web is hosted on Linux servers, and Linux is an open source operating system. The web server software that runs on those computers with the Linux operating system is usually open source as well. Apache and Nginx makes up almost 75% of all web server content, and both of those are open source. Microsoft's IIS web server, which is a commercial web server, comes in at a distant third. Over 80% of web pages that have a server component use PHP as their server-side language, and PHP is an open source project. MySQL, PostgreSQL, and MongoDB are three important database programs that are used for dynamic web pages, and they're all open source projects. And there are other examples as well. Wikipedia is an open source online encyclopedia that has come to dominate the web. It's not perfect, but it's so good because of all the user contributed content that it would be virtually impossible for a commercial encyclopedia to compete. In fact, I don't even know if any are still trying. There used to be several. The R program for statistical analysis has really come to dominate the field of statistics and data analytics. Python is a very popular high level programming language, and it's also an open source project. And many commercial software packages also rely on open source software. For instance, I believe Esri still uses the GDAL libraries for loading raster and vector GIS data. And there's a large philosophical difference between commercial software and open source software. Commercial software takes a top-down approach. Decisions are made at the top and directives are passed down the line. When issues occur, they need to be discussed, meetings need to be called, and decisions have to be made about the best approach. And all that stuff takes a lot of time and energy. And oftentimes the need to drive sales is the motivating factor behind which approach is taken. And therefore, marketing departments will always want additional bells and whistles that can be advertised, sometimes at the expense of efficient workflows and robustness of the core software capabilities. Open source software takes a bottom-up approach. It's individuals that respond to perceived weaknesses in the software and fix them without anyone telling them what to do. The motivating factor is generally the need for solid, robust solutions that just simply work well. So you might ask the question, why would anyone contribute their time for free to an open source project? Well, it's been shown that this open source model works very well for developing robust applications that simply work well. And this is appealing to many people who may have frustrations with feature-loaded commercial software that does a lot of things, but sometimes are not implemented that well. So workflow is a little clunky, or the program crashes too often, things like that. Now, it's worth noting that many large open source projects are managed by a foundation and often with donations from commercial companies, because commercial companies like to be able to sponsor features on demand as they need them, and open source projects can handle requests like this easier than commercial software could. So the point is that a lot of the larger open source projects that we're familiar with do have some sort of structure about getting things done, and they have paid staff managing everything. In this bottom-up approach where changes are made by users and motivated by the need for robust, secure solutions are one reason why so many very large applications like the World Wide Web are built around an open source backbone. It's not just the cost, it's that these solutions just simply work very well. Now many people have concerns about how they're going to get support for open source software, 
if there's not a company that they can call. And that's certainly a valid concern, but it's not as hard as you might think. There are actually many options available. First of all, you can actually purchase commercial support packages for open source software. For example, Boundless Geo provides support packages for QGIS and other open source geospatial applications, and there are many sources for commercial training and consulting services as well. There's often a wide array of online resources as well, such as users' manuals, forums, tutorials. You can often find classes such as this one, etc. And of course, there are many YouTube videos available for specific topics and books for more general topics. And if you have a very specific problem and you can't find an answer for, you can Google your question and chances are you'll find that someone has already asked it on Stack Exchange. And it's probably not just a single answer, but a whole variety of answers and a discussion about the pluses and minus of each. And I found that that's really useful as a learning tool to help understand what's really going on. So in summary, while it's a reasonable concern, in reality, for any open source project of reasonable popularity, you'll have no problem getting support from the user community or from commercial suppliers if you want to go that route. So thanks for listening to this mini lecture on open source software. This lecture is one of what I anticipate to be probably about 50 lectures in a course called QGIS 3.0 for ArcGIS users. And I expect this course will be available in mid-December on Udemy.com. As soon as it's available, I'll have a promotional video here on my YouTube channel, so subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to be kept updated with all this information. I'll be releasing a few other individual lectures from that course, about one a week or so, from now until when the course is released. I expect this course to have 50 or 60 lectures, probably about 10 hours of video in total. I also currently have available some courses on the Udemy platform that deal with creating WebGIS applications. The first course is called Introduction to Web Programming for GIS Applications, and that's kind of a broad overview of the entire topic. It's about 13 hours of content total. The second course is a more detailed look at client-side programming with Leaflet, and that course is also about 13 hours in total. And the third course is a little bit shorter. It's about four hours. I'm going to add a few more lectures to it, though. It'll probably end up being five or six hours total by the time I'm done. I always like to keep adding lectures to all my courses as students have questions, and if I think the topic that's suggested is a good fit for the course, I'll, I'll usually add it. But this course is about adapting Leaflet web maps for mobile applications. And just for reading this blog, you can use the coupon code COURSE3 for any one of these three courses, and you'll be able to get those for 80% off the list price of $100.